Okay, let's get started. Hello, good morning, everyone. Let's get started. So, thank you all for coming. Um, we actually had 125 registrations. We had to take off the registration form, but I don't see 125 because 125 is a capacity of this theater. So, um, there is some some loss here, and maybe people will come up uh, come here a bit later. So uh, thank you for coming. This is the third uh, iteration of this workshop. Um, so the third year this happens. First of all, I want to acknowledge uh, the help of the other organizers, uh, which is Matt Hoffman, uh, who cannot be here today, and uh, Zubin. Um, and we put together a, a really exciting program. Uh, in particular, um, oh, so uh, the other help I want to acknowledge, of course, um, is um, you have met the two, um, Jessica Watkins and Emma Neef, who did a splendid job at organizing everything, organizing the catering um, and, and all the uh, coffee breaks and so on, and uh, uh, the registration and printing the badges and so on. So I really appreciate that help. And also thanks to uh, the head of the Machine Intelligence and Perception Group here at Microsoft Research, Jamie Shotton, for uh, providing the funding for all the uh, catering. And speaking of the catering, I am aware that last year we had delicious food, but it was a bit uh, too few, and so this year we over-provisioned a bit, and we also changed that for tasty curry instead of the Italian uh, small snacks. So I hope you will appreciate that. Um, okay, so in general, uh, we also renamed the workshop uh, to, bit, uh, to piggyback on the hype of AI in a way. So we said instead of machine learning in Cambridge, it's now artificial intelligence and machine learning in Cambridge. And indeed, I, I can't do the counterfactual reasoning, but uh, the number of registration reflect that that uh, increased attention, so that's good. Um, and also another thing, these events have always been 50-50 talk slots between the University of Cambridge and Microsoft Research. Uh, and I think we should use the opportunity of the workshop, in particular the, the coffee breaks, the plenty coffee breaks, uh, to mingle a bit and to increase maybe the intersection and uh, discussion of how maybe we can collaborate or, or, or find inter exciting topics to collaborate on um, between Microsoft Research and the University. That would be really good. We have been resident here for a long time in Cambridge and uh, we have had some collaborations, um, but I think um, uh, there could be much more exciting collaborations coming up. So finally, um, one change which we started to introduce last year already um, is to include startups uh, in, the, in one of the sessions. And that is really because the f our field is driven largely by progress in technology as well. And to acknowledge that, we may need to look to the startup community to find really exciting applications of machine learning. And therefore, we actually invited three startups. Um, and unfortunately, a few weeks ago, I received an email that one of the startups dropped out because they made a field trip to Nepal or something. So they couldn't be here today. So we filled that slot with another speaker. But um, in essence, I'm really excited to have uh, two talks here by startups. So um, please um, stay until these talks happen. So we have four sessions in general. There's uh, coffee breaks, half an hour each. Uh, I may ask all the speakers to stick to that time. Um, so I will, I will make sure that actually is enforced. Um, so the time is general. The speakers were instructed to be a 15-minute talk plus five-minute question, but there is a hard time limit of 20 minutes. So how you divide that talk time up is basically up to you. Um, all right, so then let's get started. The first session is speakers from the University of Cambridge, and the first speaker is Carl Rasmussen. So I'm really excited to hear. Let's Thank talk. you, Sebastian. Um, so I want to speak about... Uh, inference in uh, nonlinear time series models. Uh, so modeling nonlinear time series or modeling uh, nonlinear dynamics is actually uh, quite, a, quite a, uh, a difficult task. And a lot of the methods that uh, are out there uh, are very focused on linear dynamics. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very keen on trying to push uh, some of our nonlinear uh, modeling uh, technology to, uh, to these um, um, uh, to this particular problem. So this is sort of a, an idea that's, uh, that's sort of come together uh, over quite a while. So I've listed a number of people here who uh, have been involved in this. Uh, there might have been others too. Um, um, and uh, we'll hear later on in the afternoon there'll actually be uh, other talks that'll, uh, that'll use uh, some of the same uh, basic ideas uh, of, uh, of variational inference. All right, so uh, the latent variable model that I'm interested in is, uh, is um, the, the, the usual one, right? So we have uh, 
um, some observed variables here, y, and then we think that we, we, our model says that there's some unobserved process that gives rise to these y's, and there's some, uh, there some unobserved dynamics here, and we have to figure out you know, how, uh, how, does that, uh, how to do inference over, over these models. Um, and of course, uh, we probably all know that if the system is linear and Gaussian, then we can just write down what the, uh, what the, what the answer is. But the problem here is that, that basically that linear dynamics are boring. Right? Linear dynamics can only do exponential decays of things and maybe some oscillations, right? But you can't really, they can't, they can't capture anything, anything else than that, right? So, and that seems to be, to me, to be uh, a, a devastating limitation, right? So, uh, so I really worry about uh, using linear models for, to try and uh, in model, you know, lots of things that they've been, that they've been used for. Okay, so, uh, so the, talk, the, the essence of the talk is basically comes down to, to trying to deal with this irritating fact. So the fact is that uh, we have lots of good tools to do, to do nonlinear regression problems, but it's very hard to use them in a model like this. And I'll try and explain why it's hard. So it's hard because we don't, because, because we basically, we have to model things that transition from uncertain states to uncertain states, right? And we're not very good at doing regression where there's uncertainty in the inputs and uncertainty in the outputs, right? So we have to sort of deal with that, kind of, with, with that problem. Okay, so I'll start off with a, with, a, with, a, with a simplification. So you could think generally about doing nonlinear transition functions and nonlinear observation models. Um, but actually, it turns out that without loss of generality, you can think about just doing nonlinear uh, dynamics models. You have to have nonlinearities here because otherwise you can't capture dynamics that are nonlinear. But you can get away with having a linear observation model, possibly at the cost of having to extend the state a little bit, right? And you can do that. You can see that by basically you can just copy, uh, you can just make a copy of the observations in, in the state, basically, right? And and uh, and and so and so you can you can if there's a if there was a nonlinear bit here, you can kind of fold that into the in, into the state when we haven't said anything about what the state uh, is representing, right? So from now on, I'll just talk about nonlinear dynamics models and linear observation models. Okay, and some of you might have guessed already that I'm going to use Gaussian processes. Um, so a Gaussian process is basically uh, a no, um, non-parametric model that is a distribution uh, over functions. So um, what, we, what we need to take from this is basically, given a set of inputs, the joint distribution of the function values uh, here uh, ha take on a Gaussian distribution. And the nice thing about that is that, that we, can, we can then compute very easily with that. Uh, but also, we see that the, that the inputs here, which are technically the index set into the, into the stochastic process, the inputs here are given, right? And that's what's going to cause the problem that in our application, these things are also going to be random variables, right? And then it's sort of unclear what the, what the Gaussian process will, uh, will look like. Okay, so let's try and write down a model. So uh, this is going to be, um, I'm going to have a, a function here which is going to be uh, given a Gaussian process uh, prior. So I have my function f here and my inputs uh, x. And then I'm going to have, um, then I'm going to have, so, th so this is a, this is a, a, a straightforward uh, Gaussian process. But then I'm going to have this, this extra little uh, bit here which says that, well, the input at the next time step has to be the same, basically, as the output of the previous time step, right? Well, that's what makes the whole thing into a time series, right? And I allow a little bit of, of, of process noise, essentially, to be, to be added to that, right? So now, so this thing here says, well, that the, that the input uh, at, the, um, at the next time step has to be related to the output at the previous time step, okay? And then I have uh, the same uh, observation model as usual, in this case, I have a Gaussian observation model. It turns out that that doesn't really matter very much. Uh, and I've just plugged in a linear, uh, a linear model here. OK, so I have my parameters here, or high parameters. I have uh, the parameters of the, of the Gaussian process. I have maybe the, the, uh, the, the, the process noise here and the parameters of the, of the observation model. OK, so now I can write down my, uh, my joint uh, probability uh, of all the things that I'm interested in here. And the joint probability, OK, we start over some distribution over, over the x's, and then I have this, the, the, my, my Gaussian process here on the, on the f's, and the Gaussian process basically says, well, you, know, you, can, draw, you, can, you can draw the, the, the next time step uh, f of t, 
it has to be consistent with what you drew from the Gaussian process uh, in previous time steps, and it's also conditioned on the inputs here, and then, and, the, and whatever parameters are of the Gaussian process, and then I have my, uh, my, my, my process noise here that says that the, that the input at the next time step should be, uh, should be related to the, to the output at the previous time step, and then the, um, and then the observation model. Right, so this thing here, uh, the, the time index, so this is saying that, so f of t is predicted at x of t minus one, right? So, the, so time moves forward in this step and not in this step. You could arbitrarily relabel the, the, the time indices. Okay, now, uh, so what do, we, what do we need to do here? Well, we need to, we need to uh, uh, find the margin likelihood, for example, if we want to tr uh, uh, train the, the model. So the margin likelihood is basically just the, the probability of the data. Uh, given the, the parameters, say, uh, and then integrated over these uh, over the distribution of the f's and the x's. Now, but this is this is really this is really hard to do this integral. Why is it hard? Well, it's hard because this distribution here. If you look at the f's, for example, these aren't even these aren't even Gaussian distributions anymore, right? Because of this nasty linking of the inputs and the outputs, right? So if we look at uh, what the Gaussian process says, the Gaussian process says that. For any particular choice of inputs here, the, the outputs are going to be jointly Gaussian, right? But now I'm imposing on the model, I'm imposing this relationship between the input uh, at one time step and the output of the previous time step, right? So that says, in, in, in this sort of plot, it's saying, well, if the output at some po time point has some distribution, then the input at the next time step will have the same distribution, right? So if I start moving around that point, then I move around the input to this point, and then, then that'll have consequences for all the other outputs, right? So this is going to be, in general, a very complicated distribution and certainly a non-Gaussian distribution, right? Even having one input that was uncertain then renders the joint distribution of the outputs non-Gaussian, right? So this distribution is a tricky ob object to deal with, okay? So, so what are we going to do? Okay, we can start by uh, trying to uh, lower bound uh, in a variational way. We can lower bound the, the, the object that we're interested in. Uh, so I'll just uh, walk you through this. So this is basically saying that the, the log margin likelihood um, is bounded by, and now I introduce this, uh, this, this Q distribution, distribution over the things that I, that I don't know, the random variables here, X and, and F. Um, and the um, and so what I've got here is my uh, my um, my um, likelihood and and prior, and I can basically multiply and divide by the, the Q distribution, and then take the log inside the uh, the integral or the average uh, using using Jensen's inequality, um, and you can see that you can quite easily see that the um, well, the likelihood times the prior is equal to the margin likelihood times the posterior, so I can substitute that in instead. And by looking at this equation, you can see that the that the uh, that the gap in the bound here is basically just the KL divergence between the posterior distribution and this and this uh, Q distribution. Okay, but the lower bound is always a lower bound, regardless of what uh, which way we choose uh, Q. So the idea here is to say, well, maybe we could choose a Q in some restricted family somehow such that we could actually compute this bound, okay? Uh, now, what, what would we choose Q to be? Well, if we chose Q to be of this form, basically, right? So I'm replicating from the, uh, from the uh, prior term here, I'm replicating this structure that the Fs are um, at this particular form, and then I just multiply by, by some distribution over, uh, over, the, over the Xs here, if I chose the distribution to be of this form, then, okay, I won't show you on this slide, but it turns out that then you basically get some very convenient cancellation here, and then you can actually compute the bound, okay? And of course, uh, it is a bound because we don't have any restrictions on Q. Unfortunately, it's a terrible bound, right? So the gap is really wide. Now, why is, this, why is the gap really wide? Well, it's really wide because uh, what we're supposed to, well, to keep the, the, the gap tight, we would have to choose the Q distribution to be very close to the posterior distribution, right? But now we're choosing it to be something that is unrelated to the data, right? So that's not really going to, in general, be close to the posterior distribution, right? Or we would have to be uh, incredibly lucky for that to happen, or our data would have to be uh, 
pretty vacuous for that to happen, okay? So, so uh, okay, this is true that, that this generates a bound, but it's actually not going to be a useful bound. Okay, so what are we going to do about that? Well, uh, here's an idea. We can augment our, our Gaussian process with an extra set of variables. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do here. So, okay, there's a lot of symbols in play here now. So I'm, I'm now going to augment the Gaussian process with extra variables. So, so what, what happens uh, graphically is basically I'm going to introduce some new locations along the x-axis here and some, some, some new outputs. So the inputs are called said in this case and some extra outputs which are called u. And then, and I'm allowed to do that, right? I can add extra variables to the Gaussian process. And if I marginalize out those variables, then I just get back to where I came from, okay? So let's uh, try and do that. So now I'm gonna introduce these new, new inputs u and out, uh, input z and output u. And now I can write the joint distribution that I'm interested in. And now in this case, I used to have p of x and u, uh, p of x and f here. Now I just write the conditional of p and x and f given the u and then times the marginal distribution over the use, right? So this is, certainly, uh, this is certainly true. I can add those variables if I want to. Um, and, but if I do that, then of course I've just, uh, I've just made my problem bigger, right? Now it, it's, a, it's a nasty problem that includes uh, more variables. Okay, so I can write down my bound again, just as, as I did before, now I've got the uh, so the u's are random variables, and this, the inputs to those uh, corresponding uh, random variables are, are some fixed extra per, uh, parameters of, of, the, uh, of the problem. And now I can just write down my, my um, distribution the same way as I did before. And now my Gaussian process here will be first conditioned on u, and then, uh, um, then I have to add the, uh, the uh, multiply by the, uh, by the by the marginal of, of the u variables. Okay, so now uh, I, can, I can do the same trick as before, and if I want tractability, then I have to choose the, um, the, my, my q distribution to be of this form again, having this factor here, which will conveniently cancel out uh, this stuff down here. And the nice thing about this is that now I can actually choose a q distribution that does depend on the data, right? Because, because it can depend on the data, through the u variables, right? So I can get rid of the objection that I had before, right? If I choose uh, a nice set of, uh, of inducing variables that can basically capture what is the data telling me about the, the, the function, then this can, become, uh, this can become a much tighter bound, right? So I can write down a lower bound now, which is, uh, which is the bound on the, on, the, on the margin likelihood, and it depends on these uh, three uh, objects here, Q of X, Q of U, and Q of F given X and U, right? And the parameters. So my algorithm uh, is basically going to be the following. So it turns out that for certain choices of covariance function, you can actually, uh, the, the, uh, the posterior distribution over the, uh, over the, or the optimal distribution over the F's here uh, is, you can actually integrate that out, right? And the covariance function for which you can do that are basically covariance functions where you can do the integral of a Gaussian against the, the, the functional form of the covariance, right? So there are quite a lot of those covariance functions. So I can basically marginalize out the, uh, the f's. So now I have a lower bound, which doesn't depend on f anymore. It also turns out that, the, uh, that you, can, you can do a free form uh, optimization of the q, uh, the q of u distribution. So you can basically just optimize and find the best uh, q of u. Uh, it turns out to be Gaussian. And so you can just maximize out uh, u so now you have a lower bound that only depends on Q of X and the parameters. And the final step, you can show that the Q of X distribution has Markovian structure. After all, that's not too surprising, right? The original assumption on the time series was that you had an, a, an, uh, a Markovian structure. Uh, so, uh, and I'm going to make one further assumption, namely that I'm just gonna consider Gaussian uh, distributions on X, right? So the optimal Q of X isn't Gaussian, but I'm just gonna assume uh, that I'll choose something in the Gaussian uh, family. So now uh, the parameters of my, of my function is basically the mean of the Qs at each time point, the variance of that thing and the covariance between pairs of, uh, of neighboring points, right? So my algorithm is basically 
looking at this bound and found it finding the Q of X distribution or the Gaussian Q of X, uh, this um, uh, Markovian uh, Q of X that maximizes this lower bound. Okay, so let's try and, and do that. Uh, just a brief comment here that it turns out that uh, one way of looking at this is that to see that sparse approximations are actually built into the framework because when you're making predictions about the, the Fs or when you're, uh, when you're doing the inference, then it turns out that the, uh, it's only the U's that are basically carrying the information about the Fs, and that means that the effective training set size is only the size of U, right? So choosing uh, a small number of U's will, uh, will give you uh, a, a fast algorithm, right? Of course, uh, approximate, there's a trade-off there, uh, but you have uh, a sparse approximation already built into the framework. Okay, let's look at an example. So an example here, I have a, a, a time series here. Uh, so I have time out here, and I have, so in this case, it's just a one-dimensional example, because otherwise it gets a little bit hard to display what's going on, but there's nothing in this uh, framework that uh, restricts it to be one-dimensional. And I've drawn some, some this, this is a noisy time series from some nonlinear dynamics, and we should try to infer uh, what are the dynamics here? So uh, a better way of looking at this data is plotting uh, x of t plus 1 as a function of x of t. And you can see that there's actually uh, a structure uh, in the data. And it looks reasonable to assume that this is a Markovian structure, right? You can tell a lot about x of t by looking at, by, uh, looking at um, f of t minus 1. OK, it also looks quite noisy. Uh, and in particular, it's quite nonlinear. So trying to do inference in this under the assumption that this is a linear system, would probably not be a good idea. OK, here I just drew the, tr the transitions. Um, so here I've shown you uh, what, do the, uh, what do the Q distributions uh, look like. So in this case, uh, to display things, uh, I've, I've just basically said that I've restricted the likelihood function to just be a noisy copy of the, of the latent state. right? So I can look at the, at the distribution over the latent uh, parameters, and they play the same role as the, as the observations. And basically, in red here, I have the uh, observations. And in, in green, I have the posterior distribution of the, of, the, uh, of the x corresponding to that observation. And here, I have the, uh, the underlying dynamics, the Gaussian process, that tells us what do we know about the, uh, about the uh, uh, dynamics there. And, um, and, and these are then connected, so you can see uh, how, the, uh, how the inference, which um, finds how much noise was in there, uh, what's, the, uh, what's the uncertainty on the, in, the, in the posterior distribution, and it's able to clean up the, 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 the data points quite nicely. Uh, so conclusions, well, basically, I think uh, this is a nice example of a, of a principled approximate inference method that works on, on general uh, nonlinear dynamical systems, and I think this is, this is quite difficult to do in other ways, right? So there are lots of examples in the literature of things that are restricted in one way or another. You can have piecewise linear dynamics, or you can have you know, mixtures of uh, uh, mixtures, uh, models, or, but they're all quite limited, and this is quite a general framework for, uh, for doing inference in, in those cases. All right, so I think I'll stop there to have uh, uh, a, a few minutes for questions. So how much of this requires a Gaussian process? For example, could you just use a polynomial transition model and apply the same inference technique to that? Yeah, I think you can. So the only thing, the only, the only crucial property that we're using of the Gaussian process is that you have to be able to compute the, the if you have a Gaussian input, you have to, in closed form, say what, what's, the, what's the distribution of the output. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I think you could, uh, you could use this framework in, in exactly the same, yeah. And beyond time series, is this a technique applicable to improve variational inference in general, like introducing additional auxiliary variables to achieve the marginal invariant and then basically get more degrees of freedom in the variational distribution? Is that a yeah, so this is something that's been pursued uh, quite a bit by the Sheffield group, for example. Um, so, so, the, so they you know, pointed in this direction. Right? So I guess the special thing about the time series models is that you have this, it, it's extremely layered the model, right? So it, so it depends, like each layer depends on, uh, on every other layer. So there's a lot of, 
dependencies in there. But you could certainly think about using the same framework uh, with just a few layered mo uh, model without this sort of extreme uh, Lina dependency. Yeah. Yep. Is it exactly a common filter for n equals one? Um, no, it's not for m equals one, but it would be if you used a, um, if you used a, um, a covariance function corresponding to linear transition models, right? So you could, so we didn't say any much about the covariance function for f, but you could just, you could just stick in the covariance function for linear functions, and then you would get a Kalman filter. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of usage of that kind of model, is that going to work better as a predictor or as a recognizer or both? Or what would you foresee for using this kind of uh, Okay, so I'm personally interested in using it as a predictor, but I think uh, recognition is, is uh, certainly also possible, right? And it's, it's, it, you can see in the example that is, that is able to quite nicely you know, clean up a data set, for example. All right, so, yeah. Okay, I'm afraid we have to move on, but let's thank Carl again for a great talk. Okay, uh, next up is uh, Ing Jen Lee uh, speaking on variational inference using Rennie divergences. Can you hear me? OK, so my name is Ying Zhen, and I'm a PhD student working with Rich. So today, I'm going to tell you my recent work on applying variational inference techniques to any divergence. So I think Carl has already given us a great introduction uh, regarding to variational inference. And I'm just going to repeat the setup, but from an uh, optimization point of view. So uh, we are interested in doing Bayesian inference. And to do Bayesian inference, we need to compute the posterior distribution of the model parameter given the observations. However, in most of the cases, the posterior distribution can be very complicated um, because we need to compute the uh, denominator, which is the uh, marginal probability. And computing that marginal probability requires integrating out all the parameters in the model. So this is very difficult for, say, neural networks or uh, Gaussian process state space model that Carl just talked about that. Um, so to solve this problem, we sort out to approximate Bayesian inference. That means we will find a simpler distribution Q to approximate the true posterior distribution, and then we use the Q distribution in the future for inference. Um, so. Uh, I think the main idea to compute the Q distribution is to pick a divergence and minimize the divergence from the approximate posterior to the true posterior distribution. So this is exactly the idea of version inference, so which picks the KL divergence. And I will show you why it's that. I think there are um, two main good things for version inference that help us to sidestep the difficulty of computing the uh, uh, true posterior distribution. So first, version inference proposes an equivalent optimization problem to KL divergence minimization by first flipping the side of the divergence value and then adding the constant, which is the log marginal probability. So you can work out the math. It's pretty simple. And you can see that um, the new objective only involves the joint distribution, P of theta and D, uh, instead of the true posterior distribution. So that means we no longer need to compute the difficult term, the marginal probability. So we call this new objective as the virtual lower bound. And indeed, this is a lower bound to the log marginal probability. So this means we can use this lower bound as a on the alternative to do hyperparameter optimization or maximum likelihood because the increase of the lower bound will guarantee the increase of the log marginal. So we are kind of safe to do hyperparameter optimization using that. So these are the good things for versional inference, but there are some problems with that. And I will show you some toy examples uh, to give you an intuition. So the first example, considers approximating a um, 
correlated Gaussian uh, with vectorial mean field. So that means our Q distribution will be factorized Gaussian. So in this case, vectorial inference gets the mean correct, but it underestimates the um, uh, variance of the P distribution here. So this can be problematic for some cases where you need well-calibrated uncertainty estimates. Here's another related example. In this case, we want to approximate a truncated Gaussian with vectorial inference. So you can see a truncated Gaussian uh, by restricting a Gaussian distribution shown in red dash lines in the box that is in the black dash lines. Um, so if we want to use vectorial inference to approximate this truncated Gaussian with a Gaussian distribution, then the uh, uh, zero forcing behavior of the version inference will force the Q distribution to have zero value whenever the P distribution has zero value there. So that means at convergence, it will fit a delta function at a mode, so which has no uncertainty estimate here. The final example considers hyperparameter optimization using the version lower bound. And here I'm showing you the log marginal probability in red of a linear regression of a linear regression model as a function of the hyperparameter, the output noise variance sigma. I'm also showing you in blue the version lower bound as a function of sigma, and this bound is kind of tight because I have already optimized the Q distribution for every single sigma setting. So now we want to do hyperparameter optimization using vectorial log bound instead of the uh, true log marginal probability. And we can see that at convergence, the solution we get is severely biased from the true optimum. So this is because when we use vectorial log bound, it contains the KL term. And that KL term will bias the, uh, the solution towards a place where the bound is tight. So um, I think uh, for more complex models, both the uh, law of marginal probability and also the uh, vegetable law bound can be non-convex. And we have very little idea about whether the solution we get by optimizing the vegetable law bound will be close to the true optimum. Um, so now I've shown you some kind of uh, toy samples about why KL divergence is not the best choice. And here, we want to consider some alternatives to uh, KL divergence minimization. And in this work, I will show you how to apply the version inference techniques to uh, a family of divergence called Rainy divergence. So why we can do that? I think, uh, in general, Rainy divergence minimization is intractable. But nowadays, the models we use for version inference is very complicated for these like, neural networks uh, deep generative models. And for those models, the lower bound is also intractable. But we can still do that because we have, now we have powerful tools like Monte Carlo methods, either simple Monte Carlo or MCMC, and kind of recognition models to parameterize the Q distribution. So here I will also show you how to apply these advanced techniques to range divergence minimization in our framework. So let's see the definition of Rainy divergence where I shown in the first equation. I should say that Rainy divergence is one of the definitions for alpha divergence, and there are a lot of definitions for that. Most of them include this integral term here. But I will show you in a minute why we use this spe specific form. So uh, I also listed some kind of special case that includes the uh, divergence we use um, in other problems. And one important example is here, that if we limit the alpha number to one, then we basically recover the KL divergence. So that basically means KL divergence minimization can be a special case of our framework. Before I go to the uh, details, I just want to uh, say the, the two important properties that we will use in the next iterations. So first, rainy divergence, if you fix the number of P and Q, is not decreasing in alpha. And second, we have this skew sym symmetry to relate you know, the divergence by flipping the uh, argument. So this can be easily seen by the definition. You just need to replace this constant here. And these two properties uh, are also true even for negative alpha values. 
I mean, in the uh, next few slides, I will extend our framework to negative alphas, although for negative alphas, this definition is no longer a divergence measure, but it can still be very useful. Okay, so now let's say we want to do alpha divergence minimization to get the, post or the, to get the approximate post-D area. Then I just use the same idea of version inference to form the equivalent optimization problem, that I take the negative value of the divergence and then add in the constant, the same constant as before. So um, you can substitute in the definition of alpha divergence and work out the math, but I will show you the final result where we get this new objective function that is also a function of the joint probability rather than the posterior distribution. So we are kind of happy that we all, also kind of sidestep the uh, difficulty of computing this log marginal term. I call this bound as variational range bound, kind of because the divergence is range divergence. And we can see that the variational lower bound is a special case in this framework by limiting alpha to one. So we are kind of reach a kind of more general framework than variational inference. And also, when alpha is greater than zero, the divergence value is always non-negative, so we arrive a lower bound to the log marginal distribution. Yeah, before I go to the properties of the bound, let's see how it was for the toy examples. So here I'm plotting you the kind of result by taking alpha equals to the half. So by Using alpha between 0 and 1, we can uh, compensate for the underestimation of the variance in the first problem. We can fit a better approximation to the truncated Gaussian comparing to version inference. And we can be less biased um, on hyperparameter optimization when we use the uh, new objective as a surrogate. So in general, I would say that by picking alpha between 0 and 1, um, you can change your emphasis between um, zero avoiding and also on the zero forcing. So basically, when you want to uh, fit a mode, you may want to pick alpha that is close to one, that is close to version inference. And when you want to uh, cover the whole probability mass, you may want to pick alpha that is close to zero. So for previous simple problems, uh, the range divergence minimization is tradable, but in general, it will be very difficult to compute. So um, here we use the uh, Monte Carlo estimate techniques to kind of uh, solve this problem. So here I just do simple Monte Carlo by taking the samples from the Q distribution and then replace the expectation with the empirical mean here. So this estimation, um, Unlike the Monte Carlo estimation of the variational lower bound, it's biased because the log now is outside of the expectation. But we have some nice property of this Monte Carlo estimation where I show you in this kind of uh, little figure here. So first, remember the two properties I mentioned, the non-decreasing property of divergence and also the uh, skew symmetry. So that basically means we can lower bound or upper bound the log marginal probability by picking alpha value picking positive or negative alpha lab values. Then if we use Monte Carlo estimation to uh, approximate the uh, exact bound, we basically achieve a lower bound to the exact value when alpha is less than one. So this is shown in um, these blue dotted lines. You can see that this Monte Carlo estimate is the lower bound to the exact uh, value. And especially if you just use one example, so then you can kind of get rid of this average. So you will basically get back to the Monte Carlo estimation of the virtual lower bound. Finally, you can improve the tightness of this uh, lower bound of this lower bound by increasing the number of samples. So this is shown by this uh, blue dash arrow here. So combining all these properties. Uh, we can sh see that uh, if you are limited to use a finite k number of sample k, then basically you can pick a negative value alpha to here, 
to actually um, achieve the best approximation to the log marginal probability. And I think this can be very useful for hyperparameter optimization or maximum likelihood. So now I will show you an example. Uh, and here I use the uh, version autoencoder as an illustrating case. So uh, I think now the deep generating model is very important and very popular in, for uh, research. So uh, the, now we consider fitting a generative model shown by here to the data distribution. And because doing mass likelihood is incredible here, that means we need to integrate out all the hidden variables. That's incredible. So we will use the um, version rate bound as a alternative objective for approximate maximum likelihood. So, and here I use the Monte Carlo estimates because for, for these models, uh, it is hard to actually compute the expectation in an exact way. I think the idea of a rational autoencoder is that we will parameterize the Q distribution using, say, a neural network. And the neural network it will be parameterized by some version parameter phi. Also, they will try to optimize both the vegetable parameter and the model parameter theta jointly using this lower bound. So if you are kind of familiar with vegetable autoencoder, then I will show you a trick to help you implement our work in less than three minutes. So the trick is the reparameterization trick, also used in the original paper. So I think the reparameterization trick is tries to separate the nonlinear transformation, transformation from the randomness. So for example, if your uh, Poisson distribution is a Gaussian with mean and variance defined by a neural network, then you can basically reparameterize your hidden variable by a um, link function that separates the deterministic terms here and also the noise. So then basically means you can replace the expectation of the over Q by the expectation over the noise variable. So if you do that and use a um, finite sample to estimate the lower bound, then you can push the gradients inside the uh, empirical average. And you can work out the math that the gradients of the uh, Monte Carlo estimate will be the weighted average of this log ratio. So this log ratio also appears in the rational auto uh, training algorithm. And here, the, main dif the only difference from that is we have the weight here, which is proportional to the ratio. So that means it's basically we have this term. So that means we can get this weight for free by just picking it up and raise it to some power. Um, we can see that if we take alpha equals to 1, then basically this term vanishes. So we will get back to the original vaginal autoencoder framework. Also, very recently, Berdard et al. proposed the important weighted autoencoder, or IV, they call it. Um, and that is exactly equivalent to our framework by picking alpha equals to 0. And as I said before, um, for finite samples, we can actually use negative alphas to improve the estimates of the uh, log marginals. And in this case, I don't know how to pick alpha, so I just put it, push it to the extreme. I pick alpha, which tends to minus infinity. So that mean, basically means this ratio will go to uh, positive infinity. So that means we will just pick the sample with the maximum importance weight and backprop this ratio as the kind of error signal for gradient uh, descent updates. So let's see some results. I tested this idea against the original version of autoencoder framework and also the recent idea IV. So I would say IV works much better than version inference, basically because their bound is tighter. And, uh, but our method was basically very similar to uh, IV. I think one kind of computation gain is that we uh, compute these things in a much faster way than IV because remember the back prop step, which we only pick the um, sample with maximum weights. However, IV says they 
uh, for IV, they will back plot all the samples. So that basically explains this gap of training time. Just to finish, just to finish uh, for a few more points. So uh, last, just I just showed you the example of um, doing maximum likelihood with version array bound. But if we go back to the posterior approximation problem, we clearly see that the new bound needs to be computed on a whole data set. So that can be a problematic for you know mini batch training. So we have considered two approach to do this. One is to say, okay, I derive a gradient on the fixed point conditions on the exact bound, and then I will use a mini, ba mini batch beta to approximately compute this. So this is the idea of stochastic EP. I finally re realized that, and which is published in last year's NIPS. And another idea is to approximate the lower bound using mini batch data and then derive a gradient on that. So we call this idea black box alpha. So, which appeared in last NIFS workshop. For chaos divergence, when you pick alpha equals to one, so these two methods are equivalent, and th this is stochastic variation inference. So, just to conclude, so in this work, we have der derived a kind of rich family of virtual bounds that includes a lot of existing case, and we also kind of uh, propose a new special case in this uh, framework. So we extend the techniques like Monte Carlo methods and recognition models to the range diversity minimization, and I'll show you some kind of uh, results. So I think for the future work, uh, the first question is definitely how to pick the divergence in use, and currently I do not have, an, I do not have very clear idea about that. And secondly, how to apply other tricks, for example, like control variates, that is widely applied to Monte Carlo methods for version inference to the version of range bound. And finally, can we quantitative analyze the bias? Now, now I give you kind of like a intuitive idea about the Monte Carlo estimate bias, but we don't actually know at the current point how to quantitatively model it. So thanks for your attention, and I will take some questions. We do have time for one or two questions. Um, when you use VR, you have an actual weight before the log likelihood. Would that increase the variance? Yes. Um, yes, there will be some variance here. Uh, I don't have the figure here. I can show you kind of offline, but actually we have evaluated the kind of the bias and variance uh, of this example, and it seems that for different alphas, the variance seems to be a constant. So that seems not to be a, not to be a problem, at least in this case. Yeah. More time for questions while I actually have a question. So um, you mentioned the bias problem. So there's kind of classic techniques to try to uh, reduce the bias. So for example, like um, um, the, the logarithm function to do an expansion there, right? A polynomial expansion, and then uh, do a bias correction there. Are these applicable, or is there a fundamental difficulty in in, in trying to apply these classic bias reduction techniques? Um, I mean, if I think that should be applicable. In fact, I think a lot of methods that has been used for version inference will be applicable to uh, the uh, new version of framework. I haven't tried that. I think I will try that in the future. Great. If there are no more questions, then let's thank ing -Jun again. So the next talk is Tang Bui, uh, talking about deep Gaussian processes for regression using approximate expectation. Cool. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, our recent work on uh, approximate inference for deep Gaussian processes. Um, and this is a joint work with um, Jose Miguel Hernandez Roberto, uh, Daniel Hernandez Roberto, Zingzan Li, and my supervisor, Richard Turner. Um, and here's, here's our 
the link to the uh, archive uh, paper that we just put up a few weeks ago. Um, and um, the mot motivation of our works is um, to do uh, nonlinear regressions, i.e., if you're, you are given a set of observations, uh, x, y, um, you want to make um, prediction at some location x, and we are interested in the mean of the predictions as well as the un um, uncertainties of the predictions. Um, so you just, um, uh, and I think here are the few points that we are, we think that are important for prediction machines. Um, first, it needs to be deep and wide um, because um, real-world data often contain hierarchical structures in it, so we have to build models to reflect uh, that structures. Um, and also, if we want to build, uh, if we build that uh, hierarchical structures, it's arguably it's easier to learn because it's often easier to learn a series of weak nonlinearity than um, having to uh, learn um, just um, the, the strong nonlinearity at one. Um, because the model parameters are the bottleneck between the training data and the test data, so uh, ideally we want uh, the model to be non um or let the um, number of parameters grow with the number of training points um, and let the data prune uh, those parameters. Um, the third point uh, and the most important things is we need to be probabilistic, i.e. we need to get uh, um, uncertainty estimates uh, of our for our predictions. Um, so you, you heard Carl talk earlier about Gaussian process regressions. Uh, so this is just a refresher slide. Um, a, a cheap piece is a collection of random variables, um, any finite number which uh, have a joint Gaussian distributions. Um, you, might, you can, um, a multivariate Gaussian distribution has the mean, mu, and sigma, uh, and, and you can look at the GP, and this is fully sp specified by a mean function, mx, and the covariant functions, kx, x prime. Um, how do we use GP for nonlinear regressions? Um, in nonlinear regression settings, we often assume that our observations is um, uh, is formed by taking the value of the, fun of the functions uh, uh, and adding some noise. Um, and um, we use GPs as the prior over the uh, nonlinear fun functions at x. Um, so we talk about the three important things that we need for prediction machines. It's turned out that um, GP uh, satisfies um, two points here which are non parametric and probabilistic, uh, but we need uh, deep and wide um, um, uh, as well. So GP's uh, regressions um, doesn't, doesn't have this, this point here. Um, and, and two other important things that um, we have to deal with GP regressions is um, it's, it's very hard to, to pick a covariant functions and predictions made by um, different covariant functions can be um, drastically different. Um, and we often use sparse approximations, and those approximations are quite damage, dam damaging um, for the predictions. Um, so here's one example where um, GP regressions doesn't perform really well. Um, so in this example here, I try to fit the value functions of the mountain cap problems. So this is the value, value functions um, with um, input x1 and x2, and you can see that there are sharp changes um, around this region here, and if you use a, a GP, then it just smooth out those um, um, sharp nonlinearities, and it doesn't capture the change that happens uh, in this region here. Um, but if you use deep Gaussian process, um, for example, uh, it will, the typical uh, overall functions if it look like this, so it's handled these uh, the, the change in the regions, uh, in these regions very well. Um, and it's, it's much better compared to uh, the GP fit. Okay, um, so, um, so this is the graphical models for deep Gaussian processes. You, so you can imagine um, you have the input um, as before, um, 
and you have the, the GP down here, but instead of taking the input directly to the final GP, you map that input through a series of uh, Gaussian processes. Um, and mathematically, you draw the, the, the functions at each layer uh, from a GP, um, and um, you warp those, uh, the outputs, uh, the inputs through um, those uh, functions to form the hidden variables, um, and um, I define the overall functions as G, uh, and I define the hidden variables uh, in the intermediate layers as the functions um, of the previous uh, hidden variables. Um, so deep GPs um, are multi-layer generalizations of Gaussian processes, um, and is uh, mathematically equivalent to deep neural nets with uh, infinitely wide hidden layers. Um, it was introduced by um, Damien Neal and Lawrence in 2013 in this unsupervised learning context, but uh, here we want to step back a bit and, and look at uh, um, supervised learning tasks and see whether we can get uh, those models to work um, on those tasks. Um, so here is that mountain car example again. Um, I use a, a two layers um, deep GP where I have um, the input mapping through uh, two uh, functions in the first layer, um, so at 1, 1 and at 1, 2, and then I take the output of those two functions, I walk that through another GP, um, and I add, some, add in some noise, that's in my observations. So the overall function, again, as I showed you before, um, yeah, it's, it's look like this, and it's, it doesn't look anything like these uh, functions, so it's, it's the function in the first layers are different, and this to walk through this um, highly nonlinear functions. Um, I want to make some connections to the GP state space models that Carl talked earlier. Um, so the deep Gaussian process um, is a, a stack hierarchy of GPs uh, where you observe, um, where you uh, have some inputs and you observe uh, some outputs at the uh, bottom layer here. Whereas the Gaussian process state space models for time series, you have possibly inputs coming in and some observations at each time steps, and you have um, uh, so the same GPs at each time step, um, taking the input uh, from the previous time step to form the output uh, for the next. So you can you can look at you can turn this around and look at compare that to the deep uh, GPs. And the same inference technique that Carl talked earlier can be applied for the deep Gaussian processes. Um, but I'm going to talk about a different techniques um, based on uh, expectation propagation. Um, so why, what's, what are the, the advantages and disadvantages of deep GP? Um, first, um, they are deep and non-parametric. Um, so uh, they, they can be very useful. Um, they can discover useful input wrapping and and um, compressions and, and expansions, because you can uh, imagine uh, you have the GP as before, and these um, upper layers just perform um, uh, feature learning um, uh, for the kernels uh, down here. Um, the overall mapping G from the input to output um, is no longer non-Gaussian, um, as in uh, Gaussian process. Um, also, if you use uh, sparse approximation for each layer, um, that uh, the damage done by sparse approximation can be repaired by deep GPs. And importantly, um, this hierarchy here supports uh, approximate Bayesian inference, um, which is uh, what we're interested in. Um, a few draw drawbacks of deep GP, um, the model is very flexible, um, and at the moment we don't know how to, uh, to build in uh, prior knowledge. For example, invariance in the, in the input, uh, or there's a problem with the identifiability. Um, so if you have uh, highly nonlinear uh, functions here, it's, it's very hard to identify them. Okay, um, so um, we want to um, find out the, what are the uh, distribution over the functions, the latent functions, uh, given some observations. Um, and this quantity here can be uh, can be found by using base rule, which which has the GP prior, um, the uh, likelihood functions, and the marginal likelihood at the bottom. Um, 
So we can use um, the marginal likelihood to do hyperparameter tuning. But um, because of the nonlinearity in the models, um, the uh, posterior uh, of, of the latent functions and the marginal likelihood are, are intractable. So um, here is the uh, diagrams of the uh, inference technique that we can use. Uh, the exact solutions are, of course, uh, intractable in our case. Um, so we can use uh, various uh, inference techniques, for example, sampling-based techniques uh, like MCMC um, or deterministic approximation techniques uh, like EP or variational inference. Or we can go to the extremes and just get the point estimate. Um, and the x-axis is the complexities of the method, um, and the y-axis is the accuracies um, uh, for our predictions. Um, and these guys are what we are interested in. Uh, in particular, we are interested in uh, EP and variational inference and a, a general class called Power EP, um, which has uh, EP and variational inference as special case. Okay, so um, so I'm, I'm I'm going to skip the introduction to expectation propagations, but uh, I think this uh, this is the introduction slide from EP to power EP. Um, so the goal is to approximate this posterior, this difficult posterior here, uh, by some simpler uh, appos uh, approximate posterior um, that takes this form. So this this has the uh, prior over the latent functions and some um, um, uh, approximate uh, likelihood factors that approximate these uh, the true likelihood factors. So EP performs uh, this KL minimization problems um, and then uh, min try to minimize that uh, by finding out what's the, the best um, approximate uh, likelihood factors um, where uh, we take the um, we divide, divide out um, this approximate likelihood factors uh, and then um, put it back to the, um, the KL here. And this is the correct uh, likelihood factors. Um, power EPs um, replace this KL um, diversions by a general alpha diversions. Um, and the, the, the expression inside the, um, the diversions are the same as before. Um, so, but why do we use power EP? Um, again, as I said, uh, when alpha equal one, uh, it skip uh, back EP solutions, and it's alpha, as alpha tends to zero, uh, you get back the, uh, the variational solutions. Uh, so it's, it's really flexible is that um, you can tune alpha between zero and one, and you can get a solution between um, EP and variational solutions. Um, so you can perform the, 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 uh, the procedures that I, I, I told you before, um, and at the end you get the, um, the approximate marginal likelihood um, given by that procedures. Um, it has uh, some interesting um, terms that, uh, that effectively ask whether the posterior, the approximate posteriors is, uh, is like the prior, or whether uh, the posteriors uh, explain the data well. Um, And for our case, we use um, the form of the approximate procedures is a product of Gaussian processes uh, where we use um, uh, the ideas of inducing points or pseudo data points to parameterize each GP. And uh, computing uh, the, the approximate marginal likelihood involves uh, computing these uh, difficult terms here, and um, that requires an additional approximations where we have to propagate the Gaussian through um, the networks and then compute the, the gradient backwards. So it's very similar to the backpropagation algorithms um, that are used in uh, vanilla neural nets. Um, it was uh, used in the Bayesian neural net context um, by Hernandez um, Lobato and Adams um, last year. So um, we can see um, deep GP training in actions, so it starts uh, the, again, the value function example um, that I showed you before, 
Um, we have uh, the function at the beginning, so they look very simple. This look like identity mappings, um, but if you train it a bit, um, it's quickly realized that you can um, fit the data um, better by uh, using um, the full powers of the GPs in each layer and having uh, a very different nonlinearities. And this is no longer like identity mappings, uh, as, you, as you see at the beginning. Um, and again, this is what I, I showed you before. Um, deep GP fit uh, uh, is, is much better than the GP fit. Um, one interesting uh, experiment we did was um, to take the Olivetti data set, which has uh, 15,000 uh, phase images um, uh, and 5,000 test images, and uh, crop and rotate the image and set up a prediction task so that we want to uh, ask what is um, the uh, angles uh, of rotations given uh, some training image. Um, and, the, and the inputs uh, to our networks are permutation invariant. Uh, we have no, no way to build in the structures uh, at the moment yet. Um, so if you use a GP, um, the arrows is about 16 um, degrees. Um, if you do a deep, a deep GP, you can uh, approximately half that um, error rate. Um, if you use a convolutional neural net on top of a GP, you can get down to six or to seven um, degrees. So it's, it's, it's a significant improvement if you use uh, deep GP, uh, and you get you can get better results by getting some structures into the model. Um, an additional uh, experiment we did was to compare uh, deep GPs, uh, GPs, and Bayesian neural nets with one or two hidden layers. Um, uh, using these uh, approximate inference techniques, um, so variational inference with or without the reparameterization tricks that Jing Zhen discussed before, um, PBBs, which is uh, ADAP, assumed density filtering with the probabilistic backpropagation method, uh, dropouts, which is to combine uh, dropout prediction at test times, um, and two sampling based approach, uh, SGLD, stochastic gradient longitudinal dynamics, and HMC. Um, uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlos, but this only works for small data sets and small networks. Um, for now, um, I think you just need to pay attention to the colors. Um, the blues and the blacks are deep GP, uh, greens are um, GP, and reds are Bayesian neural nets. Um, we compute uh, the average ranks. Um, across all data sets, across all the splits for all the data sets. So the, the lower, the better. And all average, um, the, 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 the deep GPs often performs, uh, outperform GPs and Bayesian neural nets. Um, we, we can have some interesting discussion on this if you're interested. Um, again, here's the same. Uh, um, we, we, we have 10 data sets uh, of various size. Um, the, the biggest data set is, uh, has 500,000 data points uh, with 90 dimensional inputs. Um, this is, uh, this shows the best results uh, for each um, model and inference techniques. If you use Bayesian neural nets with deterministic approximation techniques, um, this, is, this is what you can get. And the, the higher, the better. Um, so you use sampling, you get slightly better in some case. Um, and you use cheap he, you can get a little bit better, um, but not these uh, for these data sets. Uh, you use deep GP uh, on average, uh, is, is it get even better. Um, so I think deep GP is uh, are, are great because we have um, we have shown that it can perform well on various regression tasks. It satisfies all these uh, three important points um, and. Um, our contribution overall is, is uh, we revisit uh, deep GPs and use them for um, uh, regression tasks. Um, we propose a, a powerful uh, approximate inference techniques based on power EP. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. We have time for questions, but can I ask the next speaker to set up, please? Yeah, zoom in.
So how, how deep can you make deep GPs? And I mean, uh, in the neural net community, people have tried to make things kind of very deep for certain problems. Do you think that's necessary in deep GPs, or can we get away with less layers? Um, from my experiments, I think um, we can get right results with uh, very sort of only two or three layers uh, in GP. Um, of course, there's a problem with uh, the gradients um, when you have more and more layers. Um, so we, um, I think we, are, we need to build structures like linear plus nonlinear, like in the residual net, uh, in order to get it to work for deeper architectures. Um, but I think we, we, um, we, have, we have tools to do that. Um, just one more question. Yep. Right, so you partly answered the question I was yep. going to ask, so I ask a related question, which is that for this kind of problem of very deep neural networks, and also you mentioned that it's similar to a dynamic system, um, neural network people have come up with different hacks to make this vanishing gradient problem go away. So for example, LSTMs for the dynamic systems. Is there anything like that that you could you think you could apply to the EP um, based approaches, variation inference approaches that could um, help with the problem? I, I I don't have a good answer to that to be honest. Um, so the I think we are working on the linear plus nonlinear uh, bit, um, which is sort of similar to to what people uh, uh, with the tricks that people often use for um, for the uh, deep neural nets to encounter the problems uh, of the gradients vanishing. Um, but yeah, I okay, yeah I don't have the answer. Well, I don't know whether there's a systematic way, a principal way to do that within EP or variational. A okay, final question. Um, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I like to think about a posterior mean function of a GP as a RBFN. It's a radio basic function of a network, right, with one layer. Now, basically, if I look at your deep GP, it looks a bit like a multi-layer RBFN, deep RBFN. Have you considered, and it sounds like, okay, when you understand them to be like a more constrained RBFN, then you're kind of imposing additional structure in order to train the weights of the deep RBFN. Uh, first of all, is that intuition correct? And B, have you ever considered comparing yourself against the deep RBFN where you use the standard methods for training the weights? Um. To answer the questions, we no, we haven't compared to um, IBM networks at all. Um, but that's an interesting uh, model to compare to, I think. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with uh, deep um, IBM networks, um, but I think um, the the IBM networks often assume a certain number of basis functions, and it's, it's often very hard to train uh, deeper architectures. Um, so even even that shallow IBF is often fair, uh, IBF and is often very hard to train already. So I think, but for these networks, uh, um, I found that it's, it's very easy to train. Um, so there's no special trick in terms of initialization at all. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm afraid we have to move on, but let's thank Tang again. So the um. I think we've got the coffee break next, so don't worry. Um, this is joint work with Tony Jabara and with Justin Domke. And for those who are interested, these slides and also the papers that go with them are available on, on this website here. So I'm going to be speaking about undirected graphical models. they will be familiar to many of you, but I'll give a quick background. These are a powerful way to represent relationships across variables with many applications, including computer vision, social network analysis, deep belief networks, protein folding, and many others. In this talk, we'll focus primarily on binary pairwise models, sometimes called easing models, although some of the results I'm going to describe do apply more generally, so ask me if interested. Binary pairwise models um, still have many applications. So as an example, here's a typical grid from a computer vision application. Here, each variable would be associated with a pixel, and we might be doing foreground background analysis where we have local information about, uh, about each pixel that comes from the color and intensity of that pixel. But also, because objects in the real world tend to be contiguous, we know that adjacent pixels tend to have the same characteristics. So we have edges between these pixels which are attractive and tend to pull those variables towards the same value. They tend to have the same character of, of being either attractive, of, of being either foreground or background. And because all the edges in this model are attractive, we call this an attractive model. 
And I should say that for a binary pairwise model, we can always characterize each edge as either being attractive or as being repulsive, in which case it would tend to push the variables to different values. So here's another example, part of a social network. Here, each dot would be a variable associated with a, a particular individual and might represent their preference for a controversial topic. So maybe, do we think that the food is better at Microsoft or in the engineering department? Although maybe that's not such a controversial topic, actually, and we're very happy to be here at Microsoft. Um, so here we have, we have blue edges uh, which are attractive. The idea would be the people who are friends with each other might tend to pull each other towards the same preference. And if they don't like each other, they may tend to push each other apart to different preferences, indicated in red. So because we have both attractive and repulsive edges, we call this a mixed model. Here at the top, we have a very small restricted Boltzmann machine. At the bottom, we have observed variables. At the top, we have unobserved variables. And these are connected by edges which could be attractive or repulsive. So again, it's an example of a mixed model. And the fundamental problem for all of these is what we, what we know as marginal inference, where we want to estimate the marginal probability distribution of just one or a small set of variables, which requires us to, to sum over or marginalize out a whole load of other variables. It's closely related to computing the partition function, which we'll define um, carefully soon. And both of these problems require summing over an exponential number of states, so they're both computationally intractable, hence has a lot of attention on approximate methods. And the theme in this talk is that by combining approximate inference with clamping, um, we, can, uh, we can use that as a very powerful proof technique, and it can be very helpful in practice. So first, let me give some background on binary pairwise models. We naturally have binary variables. And we have singleton and pairwise potentials, which we're going to concatenate together into one vector, theta. We'll write theta dot x for the total score of a complete configuration, which includes the singleton and edge potentials. And the probability distribution, as usual, is given by this expression, where uh, the probability of a configuration is proportional to e to the score. And we need this normalizing constant z, which ensures that it's a valid probability distribution, which sums to 1. And z is called the partition function. It's a fundamental quantity which we'd like to compute or approximate. And we've heard earlier today that uh, variation, variation methods can be very helpful. So let's take a variational perspective here. Um, it's well known that the exact log partition function can be written in this way at the top here. Um, so we've got the maximum over mu. Mu is going to be a vector of marginal probability distributions. And we optimize over this space m, which is the space of marginals that, are, uh, that correspond to a globally consistent probability distribution over all configurations. And given this, this mu, we want to optimize theta dot mu, which is the expected score given that set of marginals plus S of mu, which is the entropy of the global distribution which corresponds to that mu. So this is exact inference from a variation perspective. We're going to consider a few different variational way, variation forms of approximation. First, we'll look at the beta approximation. And there's a picture of Hans Beta at the top right looking down here. So the beta approximation makes two pairwise approximations. We're changing the red things for blue things. So instead of optimizing over M, the space of globally consistent distributions, we optimize over a relaxed space that's easy to describe. Um, this is the, the space of pairwise consistent marginals. And we replace the, uh, the true entropy with this beta pairwise entropy approximation. Now, even for those of you who aren't familiar with this beta expression, probably most of you have seen loopy belief propagation. And it was actually shown by Didier Freeman and Weiss that fixed points of belief propagation correspond one to one with stationary points of this beta expression in here. So it's in very widespread use, and it's well known that for models that have no cycles, this beta approximation is exact. So we have zb equals z if there are no cycles. Um, and it turns out that even if there are cycles, the beta approximation is still often very accurate. But it's been very difficult to, to, uh, to guarantee its performance. And one of the things we're going to do here is we're going to show in many cases we can, we can show both upper and lower bounds on zb relative to z. So we, we've said that. Um, zb equals z, it's an exact approximation if there are no cycles. When else does it perform well? So intuitively, it performs well when you have models which are tree-like. So if we have only very long cycles, or if we have edges which are very weak, then it's like a tree, and it performs typically very well. But also, it turns out, performs well if we have attractive models. So remember our first example from computer vision, there are a lot of models which, uh, which have attractive edges. So all the edges are attractive, we have an attractive model. And empirically, it turns out that the beta approximation there performs very well. Also turns out empirically, uh, uh, Eric Sutter, Martin Wainwright, and Alan Wilski 
observed that it tends, it, well, that they, in all their observations, it turned out that ZB was a lower bound for Z, and they proved that that was the case for certain models. They conjectured it would be true for all attractive binary pairwise models. So that conjecture was open for a while. In 2012, Nick Rotzi proved it using a very interesting method of graph covers, which we won't talk about here. There was a, a fascinating method introduced by Pascal Vontabel, but it was a little tricky for some of the people in our community to, to follow. It's somewhat technical. Here we're going to provide a separate proof, building from first principles, which also allows us to derive uh, an upper bound for Z in terms of ZB. And we're going to use the idea of clamping variables. So what is clamping? So here at the top left, we have an example model. And to compute the partition function, just a brute force way to do that would be to enumerate all of the states we've shown here. And for each state, we can write down the score, we can write down each of the score, and we can add them all up to compute that total partition function at the bottom. Alternatively, we can think about splitting that total into two pieces. So think about clamping the variable x1 to each of its two possible values and then adding the two subpartition functions. So you see in gold, we've got all of the configurations where x1 is 0. In pink, we've got all the configurations where x1 is 1. And obviously, if you add those two pieces together, you get the same original total. But notice that when we're computing one of those conditional subpartition functions, we've held x1 to one of its values. And when you do that, it doesn't influence the model. And so you can consider removing that from the graph. Now, after you've removed it, um, the, if, the, if the remaining models were acyclic, which is not quite the case here, because you'll see we've still got one little cycle left. But if it were acyclic, then you could find those subpartition functions efficiently, because as we've said before, the beta approximation is exact on trees. If it's not acyclic, well, then we have two options. We could keep repeating. We could keep clamping and removing variables until we get an acyclic model. Or we could settle for approximate inference on the submodels. So I'm going to introduce this idea, ZBI, in red, by analogy to the, to the red uh, expression above for the exact partition function. So we'll define ZBI. It's a new, a, a new thing we're introducing. It's going to be the approximation you get if you clamp variable xi to each of its possible values and you sum the approximate subpartition functions. This is a new approximation. And it leads to a question, will this lead to a better estimate than approximate inference on the original model? So any guesses? Sebastian says yes. Will it always do so? Sebastian says yes. So it's very good intuition. It turns out the answer is often, but not always. So close, close. And we're going we're gonna to prove in some cases that it will. And we'll also show a case where it doesn't. So let, let's see what happens. And just a, a good piece of intuition, which, which maybe was one of the things that was helping Sebastian think about it, is clearly if we kept clamping enough variables until the remaining model was acyclic, then it would be exact. But you don't necessarily always improve monotonically, although you will in certain cases, which we'll see. So um, let's take a variational view of clamping. So at the top, we've got our, our original expression for log ZB. And observe that when we clamp xi, we can think about that as the same optimization, but over a subset. So we're going to take the slice through um, the space L, where we're going to hold the marginal qi to being 0. So because we're optimizing the same thing over a, um, over a constrained space, clearly uh, we're going to get a, a, an optimum which is going to be upper bounded by the original optimum. And that will also be true when we constrain xi to be held to 1. So both of these conditional uh, approximate partition functions are upper bounded by the original approximate partition function. Um, let me just recap notation and please uh, try to follow this. So we're going to keep using these expressions. We have z for the true partition function. We have zb for the beta optimum partition function. And we introduce zbi, which is what you get if you clamp xi to each of its values and you sum the approximate subpartition functions. And we observe from this uh, simple variational perspective on clamping here, that ZBI is upper bounded by 2ZB. We'll see that simple observation gives us a powerful result. So here we start with, uh, with what we had before at the top. We, we have the simple observation. And then, like we suggested doing before, we're going to clamp and remove variables until the remaining model is acyclic, where beta is exact. Let's see what happens if we do that for a model which requires two variables to be removed. So this is our original original model we started with, if we clamp x1 and then x2, the remaining model is acyclic. So if you have a model like that, you, you clamp and delete these two variables, we're going to get this expression. We get zbij. So this is the approximation you get um, if you hold xi and xj to all of their possible values. That's four possible settings. And you sum up those approximate subpartition functions. 
And because each of those is optimizing over a subset, each of these conditional ZBs is upper bounded by ZB. So this, in, in total, is upper bounded by 4ZB. But the insight is that now we've got a, an acyclic model here. So each of these conditional ZBs is actually equal to the conditional true Z, because we have acyclic submodels here. And when you add together the conditional true Zs, it's like when we had the pink and the gold before, and they add up to the exact true Z. So this expression is exactly equal to Z, and we get Z is upper bounded by 4ZB. And we can use that idea on any model where we're going to get a bound which depends just on the number of variables you have to remove to get to an acyclic model. So a, a, such a set of variables, which when you remove them, leaves the remaining model acyclic, is called a feedback vertex set. And we get this general bound that Z is upper bounded by 2 to the k, if k is the minimum size of this, uh, times ZB. So this is a bound which will hold irrespective of potentials. It depends only on the topology. And if people are interested, we can talk more about it. It's tight in a certain sense, but actually, we, of course, you would think that we might be able to get a better band if we could also use the potentials. So let's just um, notice what we did. We came up with an upper bound for ZBI. And, and by using this idea of, of repeatedly clamping, removing variables until we reach an acyclic model, that gave us an upper bound on the true Z. So can we go the other way? Can we come up with a lower bound on ZBI and get a lower bound on Z? And it turns out that we can the particular case of attractive models. So we have a theorem. I'm going to skip over the details here, but the details are, are on the website or ask me if interested. We, we actually have a stronger result, so it's, it's, quite, it's quite nice. But we, we show that for an attractive binary pairwise model and any variable xi, when you clamp and sum the approximate subpartition functions, you can only increase the estimate. So then if you, if you repeat as before, you get this series of inequalities, which ends up with the exact uh, true partition function. And so clearly, we, uh, we've reproved this result that ZB is upper bounded by Z for this class of models. And in addition, we have this result that each time you clamp and sum, because you have these, this, this series here, you're moving closer to the true value. So for these models, you do always improve the approximation. Just to recap, we've used clamping so far as a proof technique, deriving both lower and upper bounds on Z um, for attractive models. And we also have a one-sided bound for any type of models. We also prove for attractive models that clamping and summing can only improve the estimate. But what about for mixed models? So interesting, here's a, a small example of a mixed model. Blue edges are attractive, the red edges are repulsive. And for this model, it turns out that if you clamp uh, any variable and you sum the approximate subpartition functions, you actually get a slightly worse estimate. Um, it, it's interesting, it's, 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 this is quite an unusual case. Uh, the estimate is only slightly worse. And typically, uh, if, you, if you look at a model, uh, if we pick a good variable to clamp, you will, you will usually improve the approximation quite significantly. But there are examples like this. It's interesting. OK, so and I want to turn to some new work where we examine the same sort of thing and what the effect is for the mean field and the, and the TRW approximations. So the mean field approximation, probably you're all familiar with this, this assumes that the variables are independent and it always yields a lower bound. The tree reweighted approximation is a pairwise approximation a bit similar to beta, but it's, uh, it allows a convex optimization and always yields an upper bound. So we have this nice nested, uh, nice sandwich relationship that the true partition function is always between these two. And it turns out it's actually also not hard to show that the beta approximation is also naturally between these two. So it would be very nice if it turned out that we were able to clamp in some situations and improve the bounds we get from these, because it would give us better bounds on both the true and the beta approximate partition functions. So what do people think? If we clamp in sum with mean field and TRW, what happens? Maybe I'll turn to Sebastian, since he's, <laughs> or to anyone else. <laughs> Sometimes it works. It's hard for that to be wrong. <laughs> Any other guesses? Sometimes it works as right, but actually, Sebastian would be right this time. So it turns out, maybe surprisingly, given the previous result, that for mean field and TRW, we can show that irrespective uh, of the potentials, and also actually for models uh, where you have variables with any number of labels, you always can only improve the bounds uh, and improve the approximation with clamping. We haven't got much time to look at empirical results. Please look at the paper if you're interested, but I'm just going to show you a few quick ones. So this is looking at um, grid models, where actually the, the method uh, works reasonably well, but there are other situations where it works better. So this is not a, not a horrible, I mean, it's not, a, not an unfair example. Um, each, each of these four panels is showing a different setting. Let's just focus maybe on the top left panel to start with. Um, what we show 
I hope to make it easier to compare is in the, in the middle we're showing um, the beta approximation results. At the top we're showing TRW and at the bottom we're showing mean field, which is justified because as we said before, the beta approximation always comes in the middle. On the x-axis, we're increasing the number of variables which we're clamping. So as we clamp more variables, the approximations are improving. And on the y-axis, we're showing the error in the log partition function, the signed error. So TRW is always, uh, uh, sorry, mean field is always an underestimate. TRW is always an overestimate. And you can see some things, we, uh, well, actually, maybe I should also point out. I'm showing um, results for different heuristics which we introduced in the paper for how to pick a good variable to clamp. And best means if you pick the best of our heuristics, worst is the worst of our heuristics, Greedy, uh, where we can do it, means you actually try every single possible variable to clamp um, and see what happens there. But that gets tricky if you're going down to five levels of clamping, so we only show it to three. And pseudo-greedy means just take the best of our basket of heuristics. Um, so some, um, what you can immediately see is that beta typically performs very well, but actually you do get some good improvements with, our, um, with, with clamping, and our heuristics work quite well. So I'm just going to end with some conclusions for practitioners. Typically, beta performs very well. Clamping can be very helpful. It, it's more helpful when you have denser models with strong edge weights, which is a setting where inference is typically hard. So this is, this is useful. And you'll see in the paper, we provide some fast methods to select a good variable to clamp. The results for mean field and TRW are very helpful because that gives you guaranteed bounds, both on the true partition function and on the beta partition function. Thanks very much. Yeah, we do have time for questions. So I have a question to start. Uh, so there are other operations you could do to the graph. For example, uh, just practitioners sometimes just drop edges. Or, for example, you could uh, merge two variables, right, like uh, leading to higher order approximations. So um, obviously, you have only looked at binary models in this talk, but you said some of the techniques extend. Um, do you think? It would also allow you to, for these operations, to provide bounds or to say statements like it will always improve or things like that, or is this restricted to clamping only? It's a very interesting question, and the short answer is I'm not sure, and it's, it's, it's uh, an interesting area. So Darwich has looked at some things in this direction, but hasn't really looked at this exact way of thinking about it. I don't really know. We have been looking at some of those ideas for map inference. Um, I'd be very happy to talk about those afterwards if you're interested. So, linking to the previous talks, uh, can we extend the style of analysis to general alpha divergences? That would be very nice. Don't know. I mean, it's, it's, so it's clearly an interesting thing to explore. Speaking of map, I know that um, in computer vision, when people use QPBO, quadratic pseudo Boolean optimization, there are certainly attempts to clamp sometimes. They work sometimes. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? <laughs> I, no, so, I, so I know about QPBO. I'm not so familiar with them clamping. But QPBO is usually, as you said, for map inference. Yes. Um, I'm and not the sure. It's called QPBO dash I or dash P or whatever the, the clamps on variables. OK. I'll, I'll take a look. Thank you. Well, one thing I would say, which is just maybe interesting. So I've talked about attractive models. Um, QPBO is guaranteed to work beyond attractive models. It's guaranteed to work for balanced models. But balanced models are, I think of them as being essentially attractive. They're sort of attractive up to a flipping of variables. And the same thing would apply here. So everything I've said for attractive models also generalizes to balanced models. OK, if there are no more questions, we can go to the coffee break. But let's first thank Adrian again.